It was easy enough to despise the world, but decidedly difficult to find any other habitable region. Edith Wharton Why does old money live often on the other side of town as new money? In this episode of Analyzing Finance with Nick, we're going to discuss the geography of money and explore why people live in specific neighborhoods they do and what places are likely to be old money neighborhoods versus new money neighborhoods and what are the practical applications to this that can affect your day-to-day -day life. We'll start with a general survey and then we'll use some examples in some of the major metropolitan areas in the United States that I've lived in within my lifetime. Let's start with some general principles of urban development historically in the United States. In Europe and other parts of the world, the geography of where people live tends to be very different. And I could do, go into that in future videos, where in Europe and older cities, it's the downtown core, which happens to be where a lot of the money lives. And the inner and outer ring suburbs have relative poverty. Whereas in the US, the downtown is usually reserved for office buildings or business and tends to have more of the urban poor and the suburbs tend to be where the middle and upper classes often reside. When it comes to old money versus new money, the old money in most American cities tends to be the closest neighborhoods to the downtown core that are not within the municipal city limits of the downtown core. They have convenient access for commuting purposes to downtown and other cultural amenities, but they have enough distance to not deal with crime or the other social problems that often are commonplace in the downtown core of major American cities. They also tend to be in many neighborhoods in many regions to be more elevated in terms of an, on hills or higher elevation and they often also are at places where the climate is relatively more favorable if there are various microclimates within this metro area. Newer money, on the other hand, is, tends to be further out because cities in America have had cycles of booms and busts. And so the original money made during the city's foundation or its first major boom time got the, the nice land that was closest to the city and there's no, there's no longer room to build there with the lot sizes that newer wealth would want on their property. So they have to go farther out and they'll pick areas that are maybe have, are nicer from a geographic perspective or due to technological innovations in construction techniques, areas that are previously just too difficult to build that are more viable to build or are far enough away that there's still enough empty land that you can have larger estates and but still be at least within driving distance to the core. You might not be as close as the old money is to the urban core, but you're close enough to drive. Or if it's a metro area with multiple boom cycles, there are often secondary cores that are further out. And I'll use Greater Los Angeles as an example for this when I get into specific cities, and you have these new money suburbs built around the secondary cores and people who commute to the secondary core and not even to the primary downtown of the metro area and the old money tends to have more older historic buildings more classical architecture more established social and cultural amenities whereas new money tends to be more modern style more opulent and more focused on luxury and status symbols and you, you'll be able to see that as we go into the geography of money. The first metropolitan area we're going to start with is Greater Los Angeles. I'm more familiar with Greater LA than any of the metro areas discussed in this video. I grew up in Greater Los Angeles and even in my relatively short lifetime I've seen the evolution of old money, new money, and newest money neighborhoods and how that has changed as the city has increased in population and in wealth. And if you start with the old money in LA, it concentrated in the neighborhoods that are upscale and close to inner Los Angeles, however, well, while being technically outside the city limits. Even though there are some old money in the city limits, such as Hancock Park, 
but for the most part, they tend to be outside of the city limits too. They don't have to deal with the local city politics or a lot or have to cover the costs of the crime and income disparities and other issues that plague the core of LA. And these include Beverly Hills, which is the most famous of the old money enclaves in LA, Pasadena, Pacific Palisades, and Malibu, which I would consider the old money neighborhoods of LA. Cancock Park and, and Beverly Hills being the oldest, but these other neighborhoods have also really been fully developed by the end of the Second World War. And the result of that is that these are the most expensive places in greater Los Angeles. They are the closest, except for me from Malibu, to the downtown core of any of the wealthy neighborhoods in greater Los Angeles. And there's no room really to develop there, so you can't really have this the big the size lots if you didn't weren't there first. And so that's the, the original old money core consists of those neighborhoods. However, LA has had several booms and busts since World War II, and as the cities evolved, you have newer money. And the newer money neighborhoods are places that either are closer to secondary hubs, like instead of downtown LA, a lot of these secondary new money commutes to Century City, or they commute within Orange County, which has become another secondary core hub of greater Los Angeles. Orange County has built an economy enough on its own that most residents no longer have to commute up to LA. In fact, the average income in Orange County is higher than Los Angeles County and has a higher percentage of skilled labor jobs. And so as a result, you've seen newer money enclaves develop there. The most notable new money enclaves in LA would include in, in the North, Calabasas, and other innovations in the post-war era, you didn't have to be as close to the urban core or as close to the source of fresh water, which was the Los Angeles River at the time. So it allowed for more developments that were at aesthetically nicer places, such as the beach, but were further away from the core. And that's why most of these farther away suburbs are in more geographically pleasing areas, such as the mountains, or more notably. The other old money neighborhood I forgot to mention though, is San Marino, which is a suburb of Pasadena. That's also another old money place of LA that I should have included earlier. But that's kind of the outer core. So that's LA is a good example of how you have, even though it's a relatively new city, about the differences in old money versus new money. The new money places have more space. They're more suburban in nature. You can have bigger lot sizes and they can house relatively larger populations, but as these new money spaces can hit their ceilings of development, which is we've started to see both in the LA County and Orange County, you're going to start to see newer places become the new new money cities. And as a real estate investor, there's an interesting implication to this. One, the old money and the less new money cities are the ones that tend to go down the least in bear markets and real estate. So if you want safety, these are generally the places you'd want to buy if you have the funds to do so. And if you're looking more speculative, you want to buy the places that have potential to become new money hubs that haven't yet. And in this case, in terms of greater Los Angeles, the places where I think that are the potential to become new money are the more outer ring yet coastal affluent regions. The places now that are mostly have residents that are doctors, lawyers, small business owners, and upper middle class people that may eventually just be the place where you have more new money and elites who've earned their money in the last generation or two move to. Like Newport Beach, for example, was originally when I was born a community of mostly upper middle class professionals. Now it's more new money. That's how most of these new money places start. And they're, they're places that usually are just somewhat higher tier suburbs or professional class places that newer money moves once they run out of space in the classic old money neighborhoods. So what could be next in Southern California, for example, could be Dana Point, San Clemente, even maybe Costa Mesa gentrifying in the Orange County area. Maybe if you have more development in Rancho Palos Verdes, which is already kind of a new money neighborhood, but there's probably more room there to potentially add 
and then maybe some of the towns of Ventura County between Calabasas and Santa Barbara could also be additional potential new money enclaves. The next metro area we're going to talk about to show the example of old money versus new money is the San Francisco Bay Area. The San Francisco Bay Area has multiple rings of money because San Francisco, at least on the western half of North America, has had the most booms and bus cycles. And they've also had the most extreme boom and bus cycles, starting with the California Gold Rush and later it becoming the main port town of the West Coast. And then you have had several tech booms and busts, starting with hard tech and semiconductors in the 70s and the 80s. Then you had the internet in the 90s, and then you had Web 2.0 and the app economy in the 2010s. And it could possibly have another wave with AI and robotics in the future that's currently going through a bus cycle. And if you want to know more about that, watch my video called San Francisco is the Next Detroit. But for this case, it's going to be more of a geography lesson of money. And the first really old money neighborhoods are in the core city itself. You have Pacific Heights, which is probably the oldest money neighborhood in San Francisco. It's the closest like upscale neighborhood to downtown, and it's elevated. And since it is up a steep hills, and in the old days, really before cars were invented, it made it less attractive for criminals to walk up those hills. And you get good views of the whole city and it's a nice old money enclave. Other ones include Knob Hill as well where Grace Cathedral is and Sea Cliff over on the west side kind of by in between the Presidio and Legion of Honor. Are Those are the classic oldest money neighborhoods in San Francisco. As San Francisco evolved the first round of newer money neighborhoods really developed. Within the city it'd be the Marina and Cal Hollow is an example of one of these newer money, still fairly old, but not as old as the ones I've mentioned previously. And then you start to also see newer money develop outside of San Francisco itself and in the closest suburbs in the East Bay and the North Bay and the Peninsula. Like some of the oldest money suburbs out in the suburb of are in the East Bay are Moraga, Orinda, and Lafayette. And then in terms of the North Bay, it's Tiburon and Sausalito which are the hubs of the oldest money in the North Bay, where it's still relatively new compared to within the city of San Francisco itself. And then you go further south, the oldest money in the South Bay, in this peninsula, are neighborhoods such as Hillsboro, which is around here, and Woodside, which is close to Palo Alto, which are the older money within the peninsula suburbs, and Atherton and Menlo Park, as well. Menlo Park nowadays is where San Le Hill Road is, which is the hub of venture capital. And why is it there? Because that happened to be where the oldest money of Silicon Valley was at the time. And after several other tech booms, really, the newer money neighborhoods got even newer over time as the city grew in population and you had more wealth from the original hardware tech becoming wealth from software tech. And San Francisco, being one of the wealthiest metropolitan areas in the world, didn't have room for all these people in the, even the original new money cities. So they had to go further out to find the next rounds of newer money neighborhoods. And for this case, they're mostly concentrated in the South Bay, because especially as the economic fortunes of the East Bay have kind of dropped in recent years. The new money has concentrated more in the South Bay area and close to San Jose, which is the hub of Silicon Valley. And these newer money neighborhoods now are Palo Alto, uh, Saratoga, Los Gatos, Cupertino, and Los Altos Hills are now the more newest of the new money neighborhoods. And the thing is in common is that these neighborhoods were previously places that were mostly white collar professionals. They were doing well, but not like lifetime fortune well like that they could live off their money. Palo Alto was a college town with Stanford University. And so the educated professionals such as the academic staff and attorneys and doctors who are the bread and butter of Palo Alto now are priced out of living in Palo Alto. And this similar dynamic has happened in the other, these other South Bay neighborhoods I mentioned and in the previous ones. And I think there are certain neighborhoods who I think have potentially can become new money neighborhoods that they already haven't been the case would be places on the peninsula such as Half Moon Bay if commutes 
are no longer a problem due to work remote, I think has a potential to become a new money hub because it's got a good location. And if climate change means it gets warmer in the Bay Area, the fogginess won't be as bad. It could also be the rich, the outer Richmond within the city of San Francisco itself has the potential to become a new, new money hub. San Mateo and Foster City, which are kind of on the border in San Carlos, also have potential to be new money hubs if they're not already well on their way to doing so. And if you want to go further out, the last one I think that is kind of underrated would be Santa Cruz, because Santa Cruz is historically more of a working class town and has kind of a boomer hippie reputation. But as that generation dies off and as more new money and technological developments require less commuting to the urban cores, which are San Jose and San Francisco, and Santa Cruz isn't even that far away from San Jose, it's only about 45 minutes drive, you can be more viable to new money and live in a place like Santa Cruz. And the other plus of Santa Cruz is that it has the best beach really within the San Francisco Bay Area. Metro Phoenix is another newer metropolitan area, but it's old enough to have at least two or three boom cycles. And as a result, you've seen really a divergence between older money and newer money in Phoenix, where given that air conditioning is what made living in Phoenix really viable starting in the 1960s, the oldest money in Phoenix would be considered newer money just about anywhere else in the world. And really, and you, but you're already starting to see in the early stages this dynamic that has been around for decades or centuries in other metropolitan areas. The old money in Metro Phoenix is primarily in a town called Paradise Valley. It's kind of the closest upscale suburb to downtown Phoenix and the airport and all that without having to be within the city limits. So it's a common theme here. And the new money is in Scottsdale, particularly in North and East Scottsdale, so just the McDowell Mountain Ranch neighborhood. And Scottsdale has also attracted previously old and new money in California or other metropolitan areas who had gotten priced out of being there or wanted to retire and have a less stressful life. So they go to Scottsdale to keep up that new money lifestyle at the fraction of what it would be in other cities in America. And we've started to see this with increased real estate prices in Metro Phoenix really over the last 20 years or so. That is kind of really a wrap in terms of Metro Phoenix. The difference really is that given that most of the area in Metro Phoenix is empty desert, there's still plenty of room to build out. So if I had to see this trend continue, you know, Paradise Valley is just locked in because it's surrounded by other cities, but Scottsdale has plenty of room to expand to the Northeast for a while. So I think it could remain a new money hub and people in in Phoenix are likely not going to have to find a new city to go to for a while. The last city we're going to talk about is on the East Coast, and it's Philadelphia, which is one of America's oldest cities and actually was the first nation capital. However, it hasn't really grown as fast as some of the other boom metro areas in the South and the West or even greater New York in the last 50 years, but it still has plenty of money and its development is relatively interesting. In terms of like the old money is historically the main line, which was like the first like main suburban railroad that connected Philadelphia to the outer suburbs. And the towns on the main line include Ardmore, Bryn Mawr, Villanova, Berwyn, etc. And this is historic Haverford, Marion County, Marion, like this is the place where Radnor, these are kind of the place where the old wealthy money of Philadelphia is and where the a lot of prestigious liberal arts schools are along with large estates but are walking distance from a SEPTA train that can get you into downtown relatively quickly. So that's the old money of Philadelphia. The newer money are suburbs that were built after the invention of automobile and the interstate highway system that are primarily accessed via driving and not through rail. The newer money neighborhoods align more with the interstate highway and they include places such as Balakinwood, Gladwin, Conshohocken, and King of Prussia. If you'd like me to do this with other cities across America or maybe do a video about some doing this kind of urban analysis in international 
cities that have, have old money and new money neighborhoods, let me know and I will do some research and make that video if there's enough interest. Also, what are the old money and new money neighborhoods in your city? Because I only mentioned five metropolitan areas here and the ones that I'm the most familiar with, but there are plenty of other cities in America and across the world that have evolved to create separate old money and new money neighborhoods. And I'm curious, what are those in your hometown? Please like, subscribe, share, or comment. I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on the geography of money. And thanks for watching.